Hello and welcome to this Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcast. I'm your host, Leah Rosen, the online editor for Bioprocess International. Before we get started, just a couple of notes. This webcast is being recorded and will be made available for replay in the multimedia section of our website. We've muted the audio lines, but we welcome you to type in your questions for our speaker in the chat window on your screen. After the presentation, we'll begin the question and answer portion, and I will ask our speaker your questions from the chat window. Your questions in the chat window will only be visible to myself and our speaker. So thank you for joining us today. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Mark Snyder from BioRad Laboratories. Hi, Leah. Thanks very much. And uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning into this wherever in the world you are. Today I'm going to be talking about um, some scalable purification strategies for viral vectors and vaccines. And by way of a brief introduction, I'm going to have a, a short summary of the resins that BioRad has to offer and a vaccine market overview. I'm then going to talk about uh, virus and VLP purification with our hydroxyapatite family of products, then move into a couple of workflows, uh, one adenovirus and one uh, retroviral transfer agent. And I'm going to finish up with an influenza virus purification on Nuvia HPQ. Okay, so uh, this slide shows a list of our resin offerings. You see they're grouped into categories. I won't bother reading through them. In green are the resins that we're going to talk about today, and the little rocket symbols indicate resins which have very recently been launched. So if you're unfamiliar with those, uh, especially Nuvia A prime 4A, you might want to contact your local process specialist. So the vaccine market is large. It's expected to surpass uh, 77 billion by 2024 with an annual growth rate of about 10.3%. The gene therapy market is smaller, about 5.5 billion by 2026, but you see that its growth rate is, is even more robust at about 34%. Right now, there are some 240, maybe 250 studies going on in gene therapy in the U.S. alone and below I put the list of the major categories for which gene therapy uh, is in clinical trials right now. And there are a variety of gene vectors, uh, therapy vectors, as you might expect. So on this slide, I've just listed uh, some of the more common ones, adeno, AAV, lentivirus, and retrovirus. And you see that they have different properties. I'm not going to read through them. But depending on what you're looking for, one vector might be more suitable than the other. OK, so first, let's start with uh, some virus purification. What I'm showing here are two chromatograms on CHT type 2 and CHTXT of influenza virus purification. And I'll get more into uh, influenza virus much later on in the talk. But what you see is that the virus um, infectivity in orange and the hemagglutination titer or HA titer in red are both over, well separated from the bulk of the material which either flows through or is eluded in a low salt wash on either column. The final yield was about 75% with both of these, and the final purity was greater than 90%, which is rather, uh, rather good for a single-step purification. If we look now at poliovirus, what you see, again, is CHT type 2. CHT type 2 and CHTXT are both hydroxyapatite products. And also on this slide, you see CFT, which is ceramic fluorapatite. This is a material where the hydroxyl groups and CHT has been, have been replaced by fluorine atoms. And again, what you see is very good separation between infectious activity in both chromatograms and the bulk of the absorbing material, uh, either 280 or 260, on either, on either product. Again, the yield was very high. It was 88% with CHT and about 100% with, with CFT. And again, the purity was very high. It was better than 90% in both cases. I want to talk for just a second about a hepatitis vaccine purification. This was a VLP that was, uh, that was designed from the woodchuck hepatitis virus core antigen. And this was chosen because it addresses some pre-existing immunity and some assembly problems. I put the reference down here if you want to look up the article. In this case, purification uh, on CHT led to 85% pure material with, uh, with good antigenicity. Uh, finally, I want to put up two products which are uh, very much in the, in the public eye these days, Gardasil or Cervarix, depending upon where you are uh, in the world, as well as an HPV 33L1 protein VLP. This is all public information, otherwise I wouldn't be able to talk about this. But what you see is that with Gardasil, all four monomers use CHT as a polishing step to reduce nucleic acids and host cell proteins. 
I put the HPV one up in particular for two reasons. One is because the first step uses another one of our resins, Macroprep High S. Um, this goes immediately on to a second uh, column, which is CHT. And what I want to point out is that the load contains one molar salt. Now, CHT is a mixed mode resin for those of you familiar with it. It has two functionalities. One is ion exchange on the phosphate groups, and the other is metal affinity on the calcium sites. And those of you that have worked with uh, metal affinity resins know that they're generally not affected by, by sodium chloride. So this is why we're able to load this product at a high salt. There's no need for a dilution in going from the first step to the second step. And elution was uh, in a, and also a high salt uh, buffer with a high phosphate, which is what uh, provides the actual eluding power in this case. And here we see that there was a step recovery of 80% off of CHT with an overall purity of 98%. I want to talk about uh, some other viruses with other resins. Um, West Nile virus has been purified, or the E protein in a VLP has been purified from bacteria. Again, on CHT, you see that the load is in low phosphate and a reasonable amount of salt, and the elution is with higher phosphate and a bit higher salt. This particular uh, process was designed for depleting endotoxins, which is, of course, a major issue when you talk about bacterially expressed proteins. And also, the production costs were quite low as a result. Um, it's, uh, CHT has also been used to produce a plant-based a plant malaria vaccine. In this case, it's the PFS25 protein from PF Halciparum. Uh, it's been fused to the alfalfa mosaic virus pro code protein, again to make a VLP, and expressed in uh, tobacco plants. Here the load was in 95 millimolar phosphate, and the elution was in the higher phosphate concentration. The final product was deemed to be about 80% pure, and it was still highly immunogenic, which is important because if you purify something and it's very highly pure and very low cost, but it's not immunogenic, it doesn't really do anybody any good. Now I want to move into a couple of workflows. The first I'm going to show is adenovirus purification. The adenovirus uh, workflow is using one of our mixed mode resins, Nuvia C prime, followed by Nuvia Q, an anion exchange resin. I'm not going to go through the whole uh, the whole step developments. Uh, that's in a, a different presentation. If you're interested, you can contact me. I want to point out a couple of things. Uh, the first is that you get a nice sharp elution peak off of Nuvia Q. You also get a sharp peak off of Nuvia C prime, but if you look closely, you can see that this is actually a double peak. Now, at the time, we weren't looking to determine whether or not this double peak was due to, for example, empty versus filled capsids, but that's certainly a possibility. And those of you working in this field know that empty capsids constitute a major impurity often in final products. If you look at the SDS page gel, what you see is the harvest in this second lane. This protein is, is uh, albumin. C prime takes care of the albumin uh, mostly, as well as a lot of other proteins. And then Nuvia Q cleans everything up. And what you see in the Nuvia Q eluate are five bands, which represent the five major proteins that you find in adenovirus. There are a lot of other proteins in adeno, but they're much lower uh, quantity, and so you don't typically see them on this kind of a gel. And if you look at some of the quality outputs, what we find is that the yield was about um, 50%, give or take. DNA was below detection, and host cell protein was about 2 nanograms per 10 to the 10th particles. Now, I put 10 to the 10th particles up here because that is the, or I'm sorry, 10 to the 10th particles because that is a typical dose for uh, viral vectors, and you'll see that also uh, later on. So this gave a high purity and a final yield of better than 50%, which uh, for a viral vector is actually quite good for the two-step process. Now I want to talk about uh, a retrovirus purification on Nuvia Q. I can't go into a lot of details as to what it is, but, a single, but uh, what, was, what was wanted was a single-step purification. And this is a schematic showing the, what the retrovirus looks like with the payload in here. And this is an electron micrograph showing pretty much the same thing. What they were looking for was uh, purified virus potency, purity, as well as final concentration. Because if you start with a very, if you end up with a very dilute virus solution, and you have to concentrate that through something like UFDF or TFF, what you can find often is that the shear forces going through that system will damage the viruses and render them non-infectious. So you want to you want to end up hopefully out of chromatography 
with as high concentration as possible so you don't have to do much concentration afterwards. So what I want to show you are the scale-up results from the Nuvia Q step, and I'll show some quality outputs in a bit. But this, is the, this was the development scale, a one mil column using uh, three liters of reactor. And what you see is a chromatogram here with the load and flow through, followed by a wash step, this peak right here, and then the elution is this little peak right here. And as we look down through the scale up, this was an intermediate scale, which I won't bother showing just for the sake of time. The next scale that I want to present is a 100 mil column, so 100 fold scale up on a 10 liter reactor. Again, you see exactly the same profile, and here's the elution peak. Next scale was a 600 mil column with a 50 liter reactor. Again, you see the same profile with this nice elution peak. And the final clinical scale, which is actually going into trials, was a 5 liter column with 250 liters of reactor volume. And again, you see exactly the same profile with the elution peak here. So this scaled very, very well in going all the way from 1 mil up to 5100, which is a 5100 full scale up. These are some of the quality outputs uh, that they got. So this is some data that was in the harvest, again, per 10 to the 10th viral particles. What you see is that there was 100% potency retained, which is good. Um, residual HCP was about 100 nanograms per 10 to the 10th particles, no detectable DNA, no endonuclease, no bio burden to speak of, and endotoxin well within the limits that are required. The final virus recovery was about 65%, which again is quite good for a single step when you're dealing with things like viruses. And as I indicated before, the virus concentration of the final pool was about 2 times 10 to the 10th. Right? So if the final dose is, is about 10 to the 10th, you'd only need half a mil of this material without even any further concentration. Now obviously you have to do some manipulation to get this into its final formulation, but you certainly don't have to do much concentration, which again reduces the shear forces on the, on the final product. I want to see a few more words about influenza, which if you recall I mentioned uh, when I was talking about CHT. Uh, most influenza vaccines are produced in chicken eggs, millions and millions and millions of chicken eggs. There are a couple issues with this, although it's been highly successful, obviously, over the decades. Egg-based immunogenicity can be a problem. If you've ever had an egg-based product, you know that on the form you have to fill out, you have to indicate that you do not have an allergy to, to eggs. And because you're dealing with millions and millions of chicken eggs, production can be slow and is somewhat inflexible. Cell-based vaccines uh, to address both of these problems have been licensed now for about 10 years. Um, I put here a little cartoon of what the influenza virus looks like. It's in some senses similar to the adenovirus with the coat proteins and so on that I showed you before. Influenza is a problem in the world. Um, there are 3 to 5 million cases of severe illness worldwide and about 250 to 500,000 deaths. Um, worldwide. If those of you uh, that have read the history of influenza know that back in the early part of the last century, the influenza pandemic caused millions and millions of deaths. Um, so influenza remains a significant problem in the world today. So I want to talk about uh, one of our customers' purification of a cell-based influenza uh, product on Nuvia HPQ. Nuvia HPQ is our uh, is our Nuvia Q offering with very large pores. It's designed for recovery of molecules or, uh, or entities that are very, very large. And on the left, I put what the process is. It's uh, after vero cell culture, there's centrifugation and microfiltration, followed by uh, single step purification on HPQ. On the right, I've shown the chromatogram of an early development step. Here's the load and flow through. And then there were two sequential elutions, one with about half molar salt one with one and a half molar salt. And you can see what the viral recovery in green and hemagglutination recovery in red looks like. Uh, these fractions were analyzed uh, with a number of techniques. So on the left-hand panel, you see, the, you see the SDS page gel. And you see one predominant protein in, in the half molar elution. This is the hemagglutination protein, the HA protein. The middle panel shows this same gel, but subjected to Western analysis with an anti-HA uh, antibody. What you can see again is the HA protein here, and faintly you can see the HA2 protein as well as HA1. I apologize, they're not very evident in this gel, but, but believe me, they are here. 
If you do uh, an anti-influenza A Western, what you see again is the, the appropriate proteins. You see the neuraminidase protein NA and the MNP proteins down here. So this was an intermediate development. I'm going to show you some data now from their, their final, uh, final design. So what you see again is an HA yield of about 80%. Which is quite high, uh, again, considering that this is a single step purification uh, of, a, of a virus. Host cell protein per hemagglutination unit, which is uh, another way of measuring this, was 1.1. Host cell DNA to HA was 0 0.3. And I've shown the log removals here on the right. And below, for your information, what I put are the EP standards for a vaccine dose. And I've given the reference. You can look this up uh, at your leisure if you want to. But you see that, that both of the quality outputs. Right? We're well below what's required by the EP for a, for a standard vaccine dose. So this was a, a very encouraging response. And again, this is now going into clinical trials. So I just want to summarize briefly uh, what I've talked about. I've shown you that uh, CHT type 2 or CHT XT or CFT uh, are used as a major purification step for a variety of subunit vaccines, other gene therapy vectors, it has demonstrated utility in the purification of live and attenuated viruses. I haven't gone in to most of these, but uh, they're in the li literature if you're interested. CH CHTs also have really good performance for purification of plasmid vectors. I haven't talked at all about this, but CHT is highly used for plasmid purification, and, and we have presentations on that as well. And it has a long history of purification of licensed conjugate vaccines. Nuvia C prime I've shown can be used for purifying adenovirus vectors as well as Nuvia Q. Nuvia Q is also used for the initial capture of many retroviruses, which I haven't talked about uh, extensively. And Nuvia HPQ, as I've shown with influenza, can be used for the initial capture of large viruses with very good both purification activity and yield results. So finally, uh, we have a number of process chromatography resources. I put them up here on the screen. I won't read through them all. I just want to state that we have a lot of information available on the web. And you can always contact your process specialist for more information. This slide also reminds me to say that if you ever have any questions about any of our products, it's not working the way I said it did. It's not working the way you want it to. You want it to work better. Please contact us and let us know. This is what we do. Um, and if you call us, we're more than happy to help pretty much any time of the day or night. I, I typically am up till midnight, and I get up about 6 in the morning. So please feel free to contact us anytime you want. So with that, uh, I want to close, and I think I'm ready for questions. Okay, great. Thanks, Mark. Has hydroxyapatite or CHT been used in the purification of viral vectors? Uh, yes, it's it's been used really continually in the purification of viral vectors for for many years now, and as I indicated, it's in it's in all I can tell you is that it's in many 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 licensed processes. I I can't really reveal the number. Okay, and what are the pros and cons of using ion exchanger versus CHT for vaccine purification? So that's a great question, and it, it, it's kind of a long answer. So a priori, it's better to use ion exchange as the first step almost in any process, with the exception of perhaps monoclonals, rather than other things, because they tend to be much more robust and, and they tend to survive harsh cleaning better than some other resins. Um, CHT is typically not used as a capture step primarily because it binds some things rather tightly that you typically don't want to bind in a first step, such as transition state metals. It's also, uh, you can robustly clean CHT. The thing about ion exchange resins is, in general, their capacity tends to be very, very high. So you get a lot of dewatering through the first step that you might not necessarily get with some other resins. Um, I think that's, for the moment, all I want to say about that. Okay. So for plant-based vaccines, what recommendations do you have for purification? Yeah, that, that's another good question. So I definitely recommend uh, ion exchange for the capture step again because the, the binding capacities tend to be really, really high, and typically plant superdatants tend to be a little dirtier compared to other superdatants. So ion exchange can frequently be used with some aggressive washes as well to get rid of some of those contaminants. <clears throat> 
What are some of the differences and advantages of using chromatographic methods such as hydroxyapatite versus the traditional methods like size exclusion chromatography? Ah, well, um, so there are two kind of traditional methods. Well, there are a number of them, but, but the two that are most widely used are ultracentrifugation and SEC in some of the initial uh, vaccine development programs that I've seen. And the problem with both of those is they're not easily scalable, uh, with apologies to Westphalia and other uh, ultracentrifuge manufacturers. Ultracentrifuges are expensive, they're big, they take a lot of capital, and they can be fairly maintenance intensive, and, and they don't necessarily scale easily to the very, very large scales that are required today or, or perhaps in the future. SEC doesn't scale well at all, primarily because the flow rate is really low on SEC columns, so processing times are long, and depending upon the resin, you typically can only load a few percent of the column volume to get good separation. Maybe if you're, re if you're separating really, really big from really, really small, you can load 30 percent, but, but that's still a pretty low uh, loading volume compared to other resins, so it, it, doesn't, it really does not scale very well whereas CHT or, or, other, or all of our other residents that I've talked about scale really well up to, up to very, very big volumes. I've poured a 1.8 meter CHT column uh, with no problem at all. So our residents scale really well. Has Nuvia HPQ been used for plasmid purification? Uh, yes, I have uh, another presentation on that. It has been used with great success for plasma purification. So we're, we're actually really excited to see some, some outside results with that. Okay. Are the Nuvia resins available in the screening plate format? Yes, we have uh, 96 well plates and one in five mil columns that are, that are easily available. We keep them in stock all the time. Okay, well thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, Leah, and again, thank you everyone that's uh, listened to this, either gotten up early in the morning or stayed up late at night. Uh, again, any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We're always happy to help. The recorded version of this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing on our website, and as a registered attendee, you'll receive a follow-up email providing you with a direct link. We look forward to have you join us at future Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcasts. Look for those announcements in your inbox. Goodbye.